You are now tuned into the truth frequency. We are TFR. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to be. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. You're listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. With your host, Rob Skiba. All I'm offering is the truth. Hello and welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And today is Yeshua's birthday, at least on the Gregorian calendar. Anyway, on the pagan Gregorian calendar, I might add. Yes, on this date on the Gregorian calendar, in 3 BC, I believe Yeshua was born. And I base that on Revelation chapter 12, first few verses, I think the first five verses, talks about a stellar alignment, uh, a, a woman with 12 stars at her head and the moon at her feet, etc. And that particular alignment happened for 80 minutes, I believe it was the 80 minutes that Mary was probably in labor, uh, on September 11th, 3 BC, which was on the Hebrew calendar, Tishri 1 which is the Feast of Trumpets. Now, it is not yet the Feast of Trumpets here today. Um, I actually have to go look it up and see when it is the Feast of Trumpets. Of course, that also depends on what calendar you're keeping, too. There's <laughs> all kinds of different uh, Hebrew calendars out there right now. Everybody's still arguing about which one's the right one. But at any rate, on the Gregorian calendar, today is September 11th, and it is Yeshua's birthday. And it is also the day that I'm going to try something new here on TFR, and that is a multi-part series with another host here on TFR, Zen Garcia. He has a, a show here as well. And this is sort of like, kind of like a Quest for Truth 2.0. Uh, some of you who have been following me for a while know that I did a show called Quest for Truth with Doug Hamp at questfortruth.net, and we talked about primarily the book of Revelation. We were going line by line, verse by verse in the book of Revelation. And, well, we're going to go back to the beginning now and look at the book of Genesis. Now, I don't know if we're going to go through the entire book of Genesis. I know we're going to go through at least probably the first 6 to 12 chapters. And when we get to chapter 6, we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to jump into the book of Enoch and go through that book line by line. And there's nobody I could think of that I would rather do this show with than Zen. Zen, are you there, sir? I am, brother. It's a great honor to be here with you and I'm excited for this endeavor. Uh, definitely, with regard to the Genesis narrative, uh, most certainly there's nobody better that I would uh, wish to go through all of that than you, um, because both of us went through the journey to awakening with regard to biblical cosmology, kind of um, together, you know, of course separate, but about the same time, and our listeners were encouraging us to, to do that, and both of us were extremely hesitant um <laughs> but after examining it you know we really were led to discernment which we have been sharing for a number of years now and so definitely we'll we'll cover and bring up a lot of uh, good points with regard to um the earth and motion you know being motionless and fixed and uh, the foundation for the luminaries that spin in the tabernacle of the firmament above it so yeah, right on. Uh, we talked off air briefly, and uh, we were like, you know, just in the first six chapters of Genesis alone, there is plenty to <laughs> discuss, to disagree on, to fight about, argue. And, I, you know, I, one of the things I appreciate about you, Zen, is that we have had our disagreements, but it's never turned into ugly uh, fighting and name calling or anything like that. And so uh, that's why I'm excited to jump into this, because we're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff. 
And, uh, you know, I'm on a quest for truth. I know you're on a quest for truth. We just want to know what the truth is. And so one of the ways that I think we can go figure that out is the whole iron sharpens iron routine, right? Absolutely. Kind of go through the scriptures and, you know, um, give our take on it. And we, of course, will look into other books as well and other resources as we get going here. So um, I'm also trying to do something different in the sense that I'm streaming this live on YouTube as well with a pretty active chat there. I'm trying to draw more people over to my TFR channel. So uh, then I, I think maybe, and I don't know if I can figure this out, probably not on this show, but maybe in future shows I'm going to figure out how to... Uh, integrate also the the um, call-in number uh, so that anybody that's maybe watching this on YouTube or, and or listening on TFR can call in and uh, interact with us as well. So uh, I think... Oh, yeah, that'd be great. That that Probably not today. Um, right now, I got so much on my screen right now, I'm a little overloaded trying to make sure everything's <laughs> working right. Uh, but um, I think maybe we should just jump right in. Um, I was really trying to get it so that I could play the audio, have like Alexander Scorby or somebody reading Genesis for us. Uh, that would have been like real cool. But right before we went on the air, we did a quick test and it wasn't working. So uh, I guess we'll just have to read it ourselves. Would you like me to read? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, if you want to, let's, especially with the first three verses, there's <laughs> so much there and so yeah. much to talk about. So Yeah, that's what, something else we were, <laughs> we were talking about off the air. We're like, you know, we're, our ambition is to get through maybe maybe chapter one, but we're probably going to get as far as like two or three verses and get stuck, you know, <laughs> chatting the rest of our show. That's fine. That's all right. There's a lot to talk yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. Lots and, to talk about. And, you know, the other thing, just for the audience uh, to be aware of, uh, that we're going to do is we're going to alternate my ch- my channel, my show, and Zen's show. So tonight we're starting on my show, on my channel, and then next week it'll be on Zen's. Zen, what is your uh, TFR show? Um, my Thursday show is uh, Secrets Revealed, and it's 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Um, and my Wednesday show is on Revolution Radio at freedomsips.com, and that's 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern. And so I have to see. Uh, I'll talk to Joy to make sure which one with regard to if there's any guests. And then uh, we'll do either or. But I'll I'll let you know before then. Yeah, I might. I'm uh, just thinking out loud. might work better. Your TFR show's on Thursday? It's on Wednesday. Oh, it's on Wednesday. On TFR? Yeah. Yeah, 8 to. No, no, no. The TFR is on Thursday. Yeah, yeah 9 yeah. to 11. Yeah, that And one. then the other one is Wednesday, 8 to 10. That might work out better for me. That way I don't have back-to-back shows because, you know, my show is on Wednesday. Yeah, so yeah if that, I understand. So if that works for you, then uh, we'll do it on your show uh, next Thursday. And uh, this way, both of us, because we, we have guests scheduled and stuff like that, so we can, right. you know, every, every other week do this. And then, you know, the, other, the off weeks we can do uh, interviews with other people, other people and stuff like that. So this should be fun. So, all right, let's uh, go ahead and jump in then. Um, you want to just want me to just do verse by verse, or <laughs> yeah, let's just do okay. the first verse first because verse. Um, after you read the King James, I want to share from the Targum and also the Colrin because uh, again, I said the yeah. you know the first three verses are so loaded with information. Yeah, right on. Okay, uh, let me switch over here and see if I can enlarge the screen for the audience here. And I'm on BibleGateway.com. One of my go-to people always ask me, what's my favorite Bible translation? And, you know, I was raised on King James, and that's where all my go-to verses are, you know, that are my memory verses and stuff like that. So I would say King James is my default, but I'm a huge, big, huge advocate for parallel Bibles and always comparing. Uh, so what I like to do a lot of times with uh, Bible gateways is a little feature it's, it says add parallel and you can click on that and then you can choose another version and uh, you know there's a lot, a lot of different versions I like to compare the ESV is one I like to compare the mm-hmm. um, Amplified Bible is another one that I enjoy um, ESV the web Bible uh, the World English Bible I've really started to enjoy ISV uh, and the New Living Translation I also enjoy. One of my favorite study Bibles that I actually have uh, that I use the most is a King James and New Living. So you have the 
sort of they say the paraphrase plus the I hate to I hesitate to say literal translation because King James is not literal. It's it's not literal word for word like I've been taught. You know, in the King James only camp, they always say King James is a literal word for word translation. I'm like, well, how can you <laughs> say that when they translated Yod Hey Vav as the Lord nearly seven thousand right. times? You know, right. it's hardly a uh, literal word for word. But anyway, uh, so all that to say, I enjoy parallel Bibles. And um, that way I can kind of look at what's going on in English. If I see some major differences, then I'll jump over into the Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, or Greek. And for that, I like to use um, BibleHub.com or Bible.cc. they got some great tools there. Blue Letter Bible yeah. is another one. Uh, and so we may be jumping around on all of that. All right, so uh, reading from the King James, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All right, we'll stop there. <laughs> All right. Um, from the Targum, it says, um, At the beginning, men avela, which I guess that's Hebrew for the beginning, the Lord created the heavens and the earth and the uh, Well, um, I'll, I'll read the first three, the, just the first paragraph. And it says, And the earth was vacancy and desolation, solitary of the sons of men, and void of every animal. And darkness was upon the face of the abyss, and the spirit of mercies from before the Lord breathed upon the face of the waters. Hmm. So, you know, one of the things I like to point out is that the first letter in our Bible is a letter bait. Mm -hmm, right. Bereshit, in the beginning. <clears throat> and the letter bait is the same as the word bait in Hebrew. It means a house, a dwelling place. The, the word for house in Hebrew is bait. So yes. he starts the whole narrative by describing a house, an enclosure, yes. an enclosure. Right. <laughs> right off, exactly. Right off the bat, we're talking about an enclosure. So, yeah, uh, we'll get to that some more when, he, when we talk about the firmament, but uh, in right. the sun, moon, and stars being put in the firmament, uh, uh, Barakia in that case. So what's your take? Uh, you know, one of the p things that people always harp on, is you'll, you'll say, like I've got on the screen right now, the ESV and the King James. And I, this actually came up at the last conference I was at, actually. I was doing the conference at the Take on the World 2019. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't speaking. Uh, I think it was Nathan Thompson. I think, he was, I think he was the one that was speaking. And he said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, of course, the King James only guy in the crowd corrected him. No, 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 you got it wrong. It's heaven. And this is kind of a pet peeve of mine, actually, because if you look at the Hebrew word there, it is plural. Mm -hmm, right. It's 8064. It's Shemaim. Right. It's the same word everywhere translated as heavens, right? Plural. Yes. You know, when you put an em at the end of the word, it, it's it, that's not singular. Um, so, I mean, to say... To get nitpicky about it, to say God created the heaven, and people tend to think that that's the dwelling place of God, and of course I would agree, uh, versus heavens, I'm like, well, it's the same word. The, the same yeah, word that is right. translated heavens everywhere else, for the most part, is right here in Genesis 1. Have you run into any issues on that or thoughts on that? Uh, well, personally, you know, having done the firmament vaulted dome of the earth, we see that according to different texts, like in the Bible, it speaks about three heavens. Mm -hmm. You have the atmos atmosphere and then what would we would consider outer space where the luminaries are tabernacled. And then above the vaulted dome, you have the third heaven where paradise is located. And that's where the throne room and the heavenly temple is. And that's also where the Most High has dwelling place we see this division also replicated in the um, in the Ark of the Covenant and also in the Heavenly Temple, uh, the Wilderness Tabernacle, and Noah's Ark. You see three divisions at the Ark. Mm -hmm. uh, and where Noah um, had you know, command, that was the Holy of Holies. And we see the same thing replicated in the wilderness tabernacle and also 
Solomon's temple where you have the curtain dividing um, and then you have the inner sanctum which is the holy of holies so the division and the 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 temple and of course we know from um, Andy's work mm -hmm. that Andy the, right that the wilderness tabernacle was a dome uh, dome shaped and so the inner sanctum also you know um, that it represented as sort of the the firmament and the cosmology um, the earth inscribed upon the waters of the deep and so I do believe that as far as the Bible we see a division of these three heavens but when you look to other books like um, the book of the secrets of Enoch and the ascension of Isaiah um, and others you see a division of seven heavens and those heavens are specific to what are called the planets of the universe the luminaries that have circuit um, in the sky above the face of the earth and these are Mercury Mars Venus Saturn Jupiter and the Sun and the moon and so these planets you know, because in our heliocentric cosmology, they tell us that these planets are moving in circle around the sun. But in actuality, according to the, the Hebrew cosmology, each one of these luminaries is moving in a different facet, a different circle of the seven heavens. If you divide, um, and this is from the vaulted dome down to the earth that there are seven divisions and each one of these luminaries these planets these wandering stars hold circuit within them and when we look at uh, the time-lapse photography of the movements of the luminaries over the course of an evening that seems to match exactly what Enoch describes as their uh, their motions and their tabernacles so, so, all that to say, then, you are of the opinion that heavens would be appropriate. Yes, absolutely. So, then we have another Eam going on there, and that is Elohim. Yes. In Genesis 1, where it says, In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. What's your take on that? I personally believe that Elohim is... Uh, mentioning the Holy Trinity mm -hmm. because um, when you look at and examine all of the scriptures there's only three that have the power to create have the power to manifest from nothingness and that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and so in my opinion where it speaks about Elohim as creating and manifesting it's in mention of all three as being, you know, the Holy Trinity being three in one. And uh, they, again, are the only ones that have power to manifest, to imbue life, to create from nothingness. Um, Satan and Legion and the other angels, they have co-created power with the Godhead, but they cannot manifest from nothingness. And in the case of Satan, he has to alter um, and change and counterfeit from what already is. Mm -hmm. And so that's my opinion on, on yeah. Elohim. Uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. Same thing. Did you see the uh, the second Tron movie? No, I have not. Oh, yeah. the You should check it out. Uh, the, 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 I definitely yeah, will. Yeah, you should check it out because there is just, there's a scene in there where there's like, uh, what's, his, what's the actor's name? Um, oh geez, I just drew a complete blank. I can't think of the actor's name that was in it. Anyway, the main character, he there's like a clone of him who's sort of taken over. I, I believe his name was Clue, in the in the show, and mm -hmm. he he says he can't create anything new. He can only repurpose what has already been created. Yes, and exactly. Jeff Bridges, Bridges, somebody in the audience. Thank okay. you, Jeff yeah. Bridges. It was driving me crazy. What was his name? Uh, and they did a good job too. In this CGI, you know, they made him look young. They made him mm -hmm. look, look like he in the original movie. 
you know? Uh, and so sort of old Jeff Bridges is looking at young Jeff Bridges and, and young Jeff Bridges is cr- trying to create, build an army, basically r- repurposing stuff that the original creator had made to burst out of the computer world and take over the real world. And I'm going, oh, wow. if you watch mm, this yeah. and, and think of it in terms of what you and I understand about scripture in the book of Enoch, right? you're going to like, whoa, they totally get it in this movie. Yeah, absolutely. Man. And they are revealing it just in a, a different manner. Yeah, for sure. Something pretty cool to check out there. Okay, we got about seven minutes here. Uh, did you want to go any further in verse one? Um, I got another point I'd like to make about verse one. And yeah, absolutely. That, and that is... Somebody, I'm sure you probably get this all the time too. People always emailing me, trying to trying to convince me that the Bible is not a flat Earth book. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, like, give it up, man. And one of them, th- this guy, he he just wouldn't let go. I mean, he was constantly coming after me, and he was trying to say that Earth doesn't mean the world, the whole world, the globe. You know, in his in his worldview, uh, it just means land. And uh, I didn't even think about that until sort of just now looking at it because we have the mention of the earth in verse 1 and 2 right here. You know, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void. Mm-hmm. Well, his contention is the earth is just the dry land. Well, the dry land doesn't appear till later, you know, where he gathers right, the water. Exactly. We haven't even got there yet. You know, uh, that's what, on the third day or something like that? Right. Uh, right. You know, the dry land appears. Mm-hmm. Uh, after the creation of the ferment. So it can't mean that because the dry land doesn't even appear to like day right. three. Exactly. You know, so therefore earth in this case, while arets, the word arets does mean land, it has to mean this thing we call earth as in the whole world that we live on. Yes. Is what's going on here. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And also uh, when we get into verse two and examine it with greater detail, it's my opinion that um, the earth, the heavens and the earth in verse 1 were created perfect, mm-hmm. and then the war in heaven leading to what became the destruction of the earth as we see it in verse 2, and that this is speaking about a, a second world age. And we'll go into that when, uh, you know, when we come back and look at Second Peter and also the Hebrew for the terms that are described there, the tohu wabohu, Mm -hmm. Um, because when you turn it into the English, it means that the primeval earth became a deserted wasteland and an indistinguishable ruin, which ruin, you know, the definition of ruin shows that something happened that led to destruction or it taking on that form. Mm-hmm. And so, um, we'll, okay. Well, we'll so yeah, we got about four minutes before we go to break. So on that note, then, are you one who believes that there is uh, sort of the gap theory between Genesis one one and one two? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that when you examine it in clarity, and also all the commentaries, when you look at the commentaries, they also speak about that same thing and the Hebrew words. Uh, tohu wabohu and its connections to Jeremiah chapter mm-hmm. 4 uh, verses 23 through 30 also show that you know there's a mention of the destruction of the first world age and a time when the angels were here but there was not yet any man and yet the cities of the wilderness were destroyed yeah you know I, in, it's only been in recent years that I've come more and more t- toward that side of it the, the discussion to come in agreement with it. Um, now, I still believe day is a day is a day, 24-hour time period, what we consider a day. I don't believe in long ages for the days, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, no, no, neither do I. I, I believe in a six-day, literal six-day creation um, that began roughly 6,000 years ago. And that being the case, I have also never had a problem believing that we because Revelation says we're going to be, get a reset, you know, that, mm-hmm. that right. after, you know, after the tribulation period, everything, God wipes out everything, he creates a new heaven and new earth, reset, right? Um, whether that's before or after the millennial reign, whatever, we're getting a reset. And so I, I always, my position was, well, if we're, we know we're going to get a reset, I have no problem believing we could be in a reset. Yeah. Uh, 
and, Absolutely. and then there could have been who knows how many resets before that, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't really don't have any problem at all believing that there, there could be a massive gap between verse 1 and verse 2. That, um, you know, in the beginning, whenever that was, the beginning in verse 1 doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, 4004 B.C., as Bishop Usher would say, or, you know, roughly 6,000 years ago. It doesn't have to be that. Right. It, it, right. There could be a, an infinitely long time ago beginning when God created heaven and earth, and earth being a terrarium <laughs> that is his footstool. That could have happened a very, 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 very long time ago. Yeah, absolutely. I do agree. And when you look at the commentaries, uh, some of the ancient rabbinical commentaries, it also makes mention of that as well. And so we'll I'll share some of that with you when we get back to Somebody you. says gap theory destroys seven-day creation. No, it doesn't. Not at no, all. It I, you're clearly not listening <laughs> if, if you think that. Right. You know, I just said we both, and Zen also just said we both believe in a seven day, seven little, six day creation, a seventh day of rest, literal days. But this is before all that. This right. Is, this exactly. Is, you know, a previous world age. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, if you would pull up the uh, Jeremiah scripture, you probably already have it ready. Uh, that would be awesome. And uh, we can look at that because I, I definitely want to cover that. So um, I'll go ahead and read verse 2, and that will probably take us into the break. We've got about 30 seconds, it looks like here. So it says, Genesis 1-2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face, face of the deep. Yes. <laughs> and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, just a little FYI for everybody, spheres do not have a face. <laughs> <laughs> only only flat surfaces have a face. So keep that in mind when we come back from the break. <laughs> We're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And this evening, I'm talking with my guest, Zen Garcia. And we are going line by line through the book of Genesis. And a very active chat room. Um, I'm streaming this both on TFR as well as on YouTube. Uh, people already starting to fight, <laughs> it looks like. Um, look, when we talk about a gap theory, we're talking about something that could have happened between verse 1 and verse 2. We're not talking about extended periods of time between the days. A day is a day, 24-hour time period. Now, people are like, well, if there was a, a pre-earth, you know, the Bible would have told us. Not necessarily. The Bible is for us. It's for this incarnation, if you will, of existence. It's for this incar incarnation, which began roughly 6,000 years ago. So there's no reason for it to tell us about a previous one, even though Jeremiah does seem to imply that the, it does tell us a little bit about something that may have happened here before. But again, what I say is, look, we know we're going to get a reset. There's going to be a reset button pushed, and it's all going to start all over again. So if we can believe that there's going to be... People always, you know, we think of eternity. Yeah, we, we think because we have a beginning, it, we start thinking of eternity forward. But there's an eternity backward, too. <laughs> eternity goes both ways. You know, so if we know that we're getting a reset button in our future and that's going to lead to some kind of existence for eternity future, why not? Why couldn't there be an eternity past situation where there is something that got reset and who knows how many times it got reset? I don't know, but that's sort of the discussion we're going to have this evening is um, among other things, of, of course, is to try to figure some of this stuff out. So we'll look at verse two again right before the break. I read it. And the earth was without form and void, tohu vavohu in Hebrew, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Uh, somebody was trying to say, well, you have a face, your head's round. Um, well, yeah, that's true. I knew that was coming up. Uh, you know, um, 
Let me see if I can line this up here. Okay. Uh, face. Actually, I'd go look it up because, you know, there's always somebody, right? All uh, right. And this thing is not letting me move it around. Here we go. Okay. The front of a person's head. The fr from the forehead to the chin or the corresponding part in an animal, the surface of a thing, especially one that is presented to the view or has a particular function. In other words, in other places, I've seen definitions, the, the principal surface thereof. What is the principal surface of the earth? Are you going to say Israel? Are you going to say it's the United States? Of course, we're always a marrow centro. Everything's about the United States, right? America's right. Babylon. Every president's the Antichrist. It's all about us. Right? America's Israel. Um, you know, what is the face of the earth? You know, if you're going to say it's the the principal presented, you know, um, part of a thing, you know, the, the side of my head is not my face. The back of my head is not my face. The top of my head is not my face. My jaw is not my face. My face is what the principal part of my spherical-ish head <laughs> is the principal part facing you. So what is the principal part of the earth? If you're gonna if you're gonna use that argument, no. In geometry, a face only works on a flat surface. There are no flat surfaces on a sphere, and we're gonna get to it a little bit later. So I'll kind of hold off on it. But it, we talk about the circle of the earth, right? And right. Proverbs said that the circle of the earth was inscribed. What was it inscribed into? It was inscribed into the face of the deep. And we'll talk about that when we get to that particular day. So I'll turn it over to you. What are your thoughts on Genesis 1-2 and um, the Jeremiah issue? Okay, I'll bring it up. Um, uh, but I'll read that passage again from the Targum. And the earth was vacancy and desolation, solitary of the sons of men, and void of every animal, and darkness was upon the face of the abyss, and the spirit of mercies from before the Lord breathed upon the face of the waters. And so here, the, you know, no sons of men and no animals. So I think before we go into this passage, that we should examine uh, Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, because. In my opinion, this verse, this uh, passage, does tell us about the destruction of the first world age and tells us um, about this period that is alluded to here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Is you talking about and Second that, Peter? Yeah. Second Peter uh, chapter 3? Um, I, well, I, I've got it as Peter 3. Uh, well, verse five, where it says, "For this, yeah. and th it might be Second Peter. Yeah, it's Second Peter. I may have it yeah. wrong here. It's Second Peter. Okay, yeah. For this, they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished." But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So, you know, this, again, is telling us about the first world age, how it was destroyed and completely overflowed with water. Well, what do we see in, after verse 1, um, 2? We see that on the third day, the dry land is elevated above the water because b then there was nothing but water because everything was overflowed. It was all destroyed, and according to the Targum, it says that all of the sons of men as well as all of the animal animals were destroyed. When you look at Jeremiah uh, verses chapter 4, which is the only other passage in the Bible that says the same thing that without form and void uses the same Hebrew tohu wa bohu and so in my opinion this is not coincidence and this passage is saying something about what happened in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 so we read there I beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void and the heavens and they had no light. So, 
you know, going back to darkness was upon the face of the deep. And what are you reading right now? Jeremiah chapter 4, okay. verses 23 through 30. And so, and then continuing, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, just as it said, solitary of the sons of men. <clears throat> there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. And so, again, Jeremiah is seeing a vision of when God destroyed the earth, and when he brought judgment, in my opinion, against the, the fallen angels, because we, um, in we know that they were cast out of the heavens on the second day, and that they were here, they were creating, they were making a lot of these megalithic cities and structures and uh, ziggurats and temple complexes, pyramidal structures. Uh, and in my opinion, they were doing that uh, to replicate what they had seen in the heavens, and that New Jerusalem is also this pyramid, as Patrick Heron mm -hmm. uh, does some work, you know, mm -hmm. describing so this was before uh, there was man, and the cities of the wilderness were destroyed. And so in my opinion, again, the Tohu Wabohu, it goes back and it's showing us that what Peter described, Jeremiah also described, and Ezekiel in chapter 26, he also speaks about a judgment against a, a people of old, which we'll go to that here in just a minute. Um, let me pull that up. And the okay. Tohu Vavohu. Oh, that's in verse um, Jeremiah four twenty three, right? Twenty three. Yes, that's the beginning of that. What I believe is a flashback to uh, Jeremiah seeing this, and also in the book of Enoch, there there's a, a mention too where Enoch sees a vision. Uh, about this destruction as well and he goes and asks his father about it um, but I don't have that one pulled up but I'll, I'll go to Ezekiel 26 here verse 17 where it says and they shall take up a lamentation for thee and say to thee how art thou destroyed that was inhabited of seafaring men the renowned city which was strong in the sea she and her inhabitants which caused their terror to be on all that haunted. Now shall the isles tremble in the day of thy fall. Yea, the isles that are in the sea shall be troubled at thy departure. For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make thee a desolate city, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and the great waters shall cover thee, when I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit, with the people of old time, and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth, in places desolate of old, with them that go down to the pit, that thou be not inhabited, and I shall set glory in the land of the living. I will make thee a terror, and thou shalt be no more. Though thou be sought for, yet shalt thou never be found again, saith the Lord God. And in my opinion, this is in speaking about like Atlantis, you know, the people of old and how they um, a long time ago, they were also seafaring people. We see in the mention of um, Solon that they were at that time trying to take over and conquer the, the entirety of the world. And we see the mention of Atlantis as having been destroyed and wiped out in a single night, and it was drowned and sent to the bottom of the sea. And this fits right along with that, and I do believe that the Atlantean mythology 
is also connected to what we see because again it's a judgment against the fallen angels before humanity was here and that this goes back to an ancient ancient time you know and then we see um verses one through three and onward that the earth is being recreated and we also if you examine and look um and study in um isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 it speaks about the earth having as having been created perfect and to be inhabited and it also makes mention of this in second esdras and so these passages in my opinion allude to that the earth was created perfect but then something happened in my opinion it's the war in heaven um, and that god brought judgment upon the fallen angels for their rebellion and for their doing, as it says in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth and the Scroll of Thothis, that they were opening up um, and inviting, you know, beings from the dark below. They opened up whatever kind of Stargate technology that allowed, you know, dark entities to enter in this world. Um, we, I can also read some passages from that as well. But, um, and so... I'll read another something here. This is from the Colburn Bible. It says, It is known, and the story comes down from ancient times, that there was not one creation, but two, a creation and a recreation. It is a fact known to the wise that the earth was utterly destroyed once, then reborn on a second wheel of creation. At the time of the great destruction of earth, God caused a dragon from out of heaven to come and encompass her about. The dragon was frightful to behold. It lashed its tail. It breathed out fire and hot coals. And a great cata catas catastrophe was inflicted upon mankind. This dragon is speaking about like an asteroid. Uh, the body of the dragon was wreathed in a cold, bright light. And beneath, on the belly was a ruddy-hued glow, while behind it trailed a flowing tail of smoke. It spewed out cinders and hot stones, and its breath was foul and stenchful, poisoning the nostrils of men. Its passage caused great thunderings and lightnings to rend the thick, darkened sky, all heaven and earth being made hot. The seas were loosened from their cradles and rose up, pouring across the land, there was an awful shrilling, trumpeting, which outpowered even the howling of the unleashed winds. Men stricken with terror went mad at the awful sight in the heavens. They were loosed from their senses and dashed about, crazed, not knowing what they did. The breath was sucked from their bodies and they were burnt with a strange ass, ash, and then it passed, leaving earth enwrapped within a dark and glowing mantle, which was ruddily lit up inside. The bowels of the earth were torn open in great writhing upheavals, and a howling whirlwind rent the mountains apart. The wrath of the sky monster was loosed in the heavens. It lashed about in flaming fury, roaring like a thousand thunders, it poured down fiery destruction amid a welter of thick black blood. So awesome was the fearfully aspected thing that the memory mercifully departed from man. His thoughts were smothered under a cloud of forgetfulness. The earth vomited forth great gusts of foul breath from awful mouths, opening up in the midst of the land. The evil breath bit at the throat before it drove men mad and killed them. Those who did not die in this manner were smothered under a cloud of red dust and ashes or were swallowed by the yawning mouths of earth or crushed beneath crashing rocks. I'm almost done here, too. The first sky monster was joined by another, which swallowed the tail of the one going before but the two could not be seen at once. The sky monster reigned and raged above earth, doing battle to possess it.
but the many-bladed sword of God cut them in pieces, and their falling bodies enlarged the lands and the sea. In this manner the first earth was destroyed by calamity, descending from out of the skies. The vaults of heaven had opened to bring forth monsters more fearsome than any that ever haunted the uneasy dreams of men. Uh, final passage here. Men and their dwelling places were gone. Only sky boulders and red earth remained where once there were. But amidst all the desolation, a few survived, for man is not easily destroyed. They crept out from caves and came down from the mountainsides. Their eyes were wild and their limbs trembled. Their bodies shook and their tongues lacked control. Their faces were twisted and the skin hung loose on their bones. They were as maddened wild beasts driven into an enclosure before flames. They knew no law, being deprived of all the wisdom they once had, and those who had guided them were gone. The earth, only true altar of God, had offered up a sacrifice of life and sorrow to atone for the sins of mankind. Man had not sinned in deed, but in the things he had failed to do. Man suffers not only for what he does, but what he fails to do. He is not chastised for making mistakes, but for failing to recognize and to rectify them. And uh, it goes on more, but that gives you an idea as to, you know, the destruction. and Because it is mentioned in the ancient accounts. And uh, I'll share one other passage. It's from the legends of the Jews. And it also makes mention of how the earth had been previously destroyed. It says, nor is this world inhabited by man, the first of things earthly created by God. He made several worlds before ours, but he destroyed them all, because he was pleased with none until he created ours. But even this last world would have had no permanence if God had executed his original plan of ruling it according to the principle of strict justice. When God made our present heavens and our present earth, the new heavens and the new earth were also brought forth, yea, and the hundred and ninety-six thousand worlds which God created unto his own glory. And so that's the legends of the Jews. So, and so uh, yeah, okay, so you uh, people are asking in the uh, chat room, which has gone quite active, <laughs> um, you were reading, most of that that you were reading earlier was from the uh, Colburn Bible? Yes, the Colburn Bible on the recreation, the destruction and recreation of the earth. So talk a little bit, if you would, about the Colburn Bible for people who are unfamiliar with it. Uh, what is the Colburn Bible? Where did it come from? And what's your take on it? Uh, the Colburn Bible is a text that was preserved in the Glastonbury Abbey for a very long time. It comes from the Saxons, which are the sons of Isaac that had migrated there. They say that uh, Jeremiah had taken um, the princess Sotu, who was the, uh, it, and she became the queen of the Scottish people there, but that she has connections to uh, the royal bloodline, that she, uh, you know, is, um, and also that Jeremiah left there and that they carried this particular account. Uh, if people want to know more, I would just, recommend looking up the Colburn Bible and Glenn Kimball because he was one of the individuals that received um, I believe it was in 2006 that the people, the family that were entrusted, uh, the Coldian Trust, they gave out to six different individuals copies of the Colburn Bible and told them to release it to the world. Glenn Kimball released a copy. Marshall Masters re released a copy. The Coldian Trust and others also uh, released copies of this particular text that had been preserved, and it's very ancient. And it's a parallel account of our, you know, Bible as far as Genesis, um, except for it contains a lot of information that is dissimilar. Um, and also, it covers the perspective of 
both the Egyptian and the Celtic priesthood. So it does come from a line and perspective of pagan peoples. But they do make mention of, uh, for instance, the Hebrews and the Exodus, and it also makes mention of this particular object, which it is, speaks about it here as a sky monster, but in the Colbrin it's called the Destroyer. And in my opinion, it is connected to what we see in Revelation 9 as wormwood. And that this particular object is utilized by the Most High God every, whenever he wants to bring judgment and destruction to the earth and to reset. Um, and that it is said to have visited uh, during the time of Exodus and was part of the the judgment, the plagues, um, it had some part to play in all of that as well. And that the red dust that we see mentioned in this particular passage also has connection to Revelation, where we see that there's this, you know, the, the rivers and all the waters are turned to blood. Um, it's, you know, speculated that this object, it when it comes... It releases this red dust. Um, and what I don't understand how or know the details of it, but in the different accounts of its passage and its coming and its interaction with the earth, uh, that seems to be one of the signs that the waters are turned to blood. And I speculate that it could be this dust that is causing it and that maybe it also makes it undrinkable and um not for sure on that, but um, certainly this text was preserved and it has a very long history. As you can see here, it does contain and make mention of, which uh, even I do believe our Bible also speaks about this, and that Peter describes the world that then was, um, and that this particular world age was destroyed by water, overflowed. And we can see um, accounts of this also found in other texts. And the again, the mention of the destruction of um, Atlantis. And there's a, another scroll specific to the Colburn Bible called the Scroll of Thothis, which I'll pull up. And um, it's a fascinating text. And it is very interesting. And it makes mention of um, you know, again, as far as the the pre-world, the antediluvian world, the prior times, what the Egyptians called Zeptepe, which, you know, they tell us that back then um, the demigods uh, ruled upon the earth, which I believe are the fallen angels, you know, the fallen ones, um, Lucifer and Legion, that cast out on the second day, according to the book of the secrets of Enoch. Uh, chapters right. 29 and 30. Hold that thought. Oh, okay. You want to break? Oh, that one fast. This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. We're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, for the second hour of the broadcast. I'm talking with my guest, Zen Garcia, and we are going through the book of Genesis, line by line, verse by verse, and, of course, looking at other resources as we go along. Now, look, guys, we're not trying to tell anybody what to believe. People are getting all upset. <laughs> um, we are just exploring things that other people have believed in the past that have written about these things, something I think people need to understand also is the word Targum is not the same as Talmud. 
Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, t- people goodness. hear these words and they're like, oh, you, you know, whatever. They're freaking out, you know, thinking we're all of a sudden uh-huh. either either a bunch of Kabbalists or Zionists or something. Uh, no. The, the word Targum, correct me if I'm wrong, Zen, is simply translation. A right. translation. So your King James Bible is a Targum. It's a Targum, exactly. <laughs> it's a translation of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek text. It's a Targum. So when Zen was reading the Targums, he was reading early... Tra- you reading like a... a the Aramaic. Aramaic Targum. Okay. Yes. So... Which predates the even the Greek Septuagint. It's a... Uh, 100 to 200 years older and it dates back to the diaspora when the uh, the Hebrew Israelites were released from the bondage of Babylon and allowed to return to um, Jerusalem to rebuild the Holy Temple and then during the diaspora they assimilated Aramaic as their predominant lexicon and so the rabbis uh, the ha- kept having to translate the Hebrew Torah that they were reading from into Aramaic and so they authorized this translation which is the Targum the Aramaic Targum it's the oldest most widely known most well respected most recognized and it's the first translation of the Hebrew Torah into a different language and it's the one it's the scriptures that the Israelites themselves used when they started you know, worship again in the Holy Temple after the diaspora, which was date it dates back to like four hundred uh, something, four eighty something BC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so people don't need to be freaking out when we're talking about targums. We're talking <laughs> about Hebrew translations. You know, if, if you're gonna freak out about targum, then you might as well throw your King James in the garbage and freak out over that too. Uh, and, and that's right. 1,611 years removed from the originals. So uh, right. now we're talking, this is what has intrigued me. I, you're a lot more familiar with the Targums than I am. I have only recently begun to explore them uh, primarily as a result of looking into things like the biblical cosmology and stuff like that. Um, but, I mean, what has intrigued me is they will a lot of times add commentary. You know, so it, we'll get to that certainly when we get to Genesis chapter four, <laughs> verse one in particular. Right. Um, but yeah, th- this was this shows their understanding. Like exactly when they read the various passages, how did they understand it? Now, when we look at like for instance the Amplified Bible, now the Amplified Bible are tr- English translators looking at the text and saying, okay, I can expand on this word, and so they'll put you know parentheses there and you know put something kind of elaboration as you're reading the text to to just what it sounds like amplify what is being said. So our English translators, when they made the Amplified Bible, they're essentially doing about the same thing as correct me if I'm wrong, as what the uh, authors of the Targum did. As they were translating, they were doing their parentheticals saying, hey, this is what we understand about X, Y, Z. Yeah, but I, I take it, um, you know, I, I'm, as far as the commentary, even though there is a lot of additional material found in the Aramaic Targum, I don't necessarily believe it all to be commentary. Mm-hmm. I, I actually believe it to be uh, scripture and information that was there previous to what our our modern English and also oh interesting um, you know Greek translations. So so okay, this is this uh, opens up an interesting can of worms. And so, do you think then that it's been some sort of conspiracy to hide certain things um, in the translations that we have today in the manuscripts that they were based on? Oh, absolutely, and and I'll give you an example of this. In the in the Aramaic Targum, in the first five books, which you know the the Targum, that's all they were back then. The original Targum, that's the first five books, the Pentateuch, the Tanakh. That's all they used. That's all they had. Uh, if you read in the Aramaic Targum, you will find that there are two hundred and seventeen translations for the word of the Lord found within the scriptures. You look at the modern King James version, there are only 11 translations for the word of the Lord in our modern English translations. And so what it shows, and we, 
you know, confirm this because we did a chapter by chapter, 40 week study of the Targum from Genesis all the way through Exodus before we got to, you know, the old law. Um, but again, there are 217 passages connected that showed the word of the Lord, which is Christ, the Logos, the Memra, uh, was involved in great manner with the patriarchs of old, and that he was responsible for involvement even with Abraham, Isaac, he's called the helper, um, you know, and that the Messiah was all throughout the Pentateuch involved deeply with the patriarchs, with the prophets, and with Israel as nation and you can't have 217 mistakes where the word of the Lord has been it's the word of has been taken out and it's just been made Lord and you know that's different because it taking the word of the Lord out and putting only Lord in ascribes it to the father you know to Yahweh Yod Heh Vod Heh but when you read the original Aramaic, you see that the son was deeply involved in relationship with the Hebrew patriarchs. And you don't just accidentally mistranslate or misinterpret uh, 217 times what should be word of the Lord and change it into Lord. In my opinion, it shows an organized effort to remove Christ mm. from the early scriptures. Right, because and, we would understand the word of the Lord, the word that was in the beginning with God, the word was God, became exactly. flesh, you know, yes. and, and by him and through him were all things created. You know, we have all exactly. these scriptures talking about the word being Yeshua that was made flesh. That's interesting. I haven't looked into any of that. So you're saying that it had previously said the word of the Lord how many times? 217 in the first five books. Wow, in the Torah. Yeah, uh, in the Torah. So you see, this is wow. That's really interesting. Um, you know, people oh, have it. That's massively huge because people have asked me, you know, what, you know, what's the deal with the why are you into the Torah and all this stuff? And I've said the story. I've told the story before. It's that Yeshua was walking on the road to Emmaus. I'm reading this this scripture, in the in the I think it's the Gospel of Luke, and it says he began with Moses to tell these guys who he was. And, right. and in the end of the book of Acts, we see that Paul's doing the same thing. He's in a rented house, and he's beginning with Moses to tell people who Yeshua was. And Yeshua himself says, look, if you don't believe Moses, you're not going to believe me, you know, because he wrote about me. And I'm going, w when did Moses write about him? You know, like, how how is it that Yeshua himself is saying that Moses exactly. testifies of him? And, you know, that began my prayer in 2010, uh, and, and to, to the point where I am now, where I was intentionally trying to find Yeshua in the Torah. And, of course, once you, you dive into the Moedim, the, the appointed times, the, the feasts, and all that kind of stuff, th there's lots of places where you find him, where, where he starts showing up all over the place. But that's even more. That's like point blank. That and the, um, uh, who's the guy that wrote the Olive Tav scriptures? I um, can't think of the guy's name. Do you know that guy? Anyway, no. th there's a, I forget the guy's name. He wrote a book called the Aleph Tav Scriptures. And it, it's the Bible, but where, whenever the Aleph Tav shows up as an untranslated word, uh, it's a, uh, what they call in Hebrew, uh, a direct object marker, grammatically. You know, uh, um, I forget exactly how it works grammatically, but th there's a grammatical function for the Aleph Tav. But there are, I forget how many hundreds or thousands of standalone, what they call standalone Aleph Tavs, that don't serve the function of a direct object marker in, in grammar. And and they're saying that's Yeshua. In Greek, that's Alpha and Omega. You know, uh -huh. it, yeah, absolutely. Where, where, I fully agree. Where Jesus said, I am. And, and what's interesting about that is in Revelation, where he says that he is the Alpha and Omega, he says that in reference to quoting uh, Zechariah 12.10, I believe, is the, is the reference. In Revelation 1.7, if memory serves, he talks about, you know, they who... They, they shall uh, they who pierced him shall see him and mourn right yes uh -huh. he's quoting Zechariah 12:10 if you go back and read Zechariah 12:10 when it says you know the, talking about they who pierced him if i remember right i don't don't quote me on this it could be wrong but if i remember right there was an all of tav right before him they they mm -hmm. shall see him and mourn there's like all of tav and him 
And so he's quoting that scripture where there's a standalone olive tov, and he says, I am the olive tov. Like he's saying, look, I'm right. the olive tov in Zechariah yeah. 1210. You know, I'm, I'm right. the Alpha and Omega. So um, it, we, we call uh, one of the guys that are uh, uh, Bible studies, he, he calls it the et watch because that's how you pronounce the olive tov is et. And so um, he has one of those olive tov scriptures. And whenever we were doing Bible study, whenever the olive tov showed up, you go, oh, et watch. You know, and we would see, you know, where Yeshua is all over the place. You know, if he is, in fact, what he said he is, I am the Alpha Tav, I am the Alpha yes. Omega. And right. so all those standalone Alpha Tavs that are not serving the function of a direct object marker grammatically are there for another reason. Okay, then he's all over the place, you know, throughout the Torah, the Prophets, the Old Testament. But this takes it to a whole other level. You're saying right. the word of the Lord and we understand he's the word made flesh, was intentionally pulled out, and it just now says yod heh yeah. instead of the, the word of yod heh vav Yes. Uh, and what I'll, what I'll do is, because I've done many shows on this, uh, not only have I done it from the Targum, but also I have the Targum of Psalms. And you see also the word of the Lord removed many, many times from that text as well, as well as in the targum translation of isaiah and so you see an organized effort to remove the word of the lord from all of these ancient texts mm. and it's only when you go back to the aramaic um, that you see all of this restored and i'll give you some examples here um it says here in, from genesis you know 126 28 um and the word of the Lord created man in his likeness, in the oh, likeness wow. of the presence of the Lord. He created him, the male and his yoke fellow. He created them. Uh, wow. Another so, one. So we're in King James, Genesis 1, 27, and Elohim said God. Or, or, so Elohim, God, yes, created man right. in his own image, in the image of God. Elohim created he, yes. him, male and female created he, them. Right. You're saying there it says in the Targums, and the word of yod heh vav -Heh created man in his own image? Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah, and I'll share a few more. That's um, crazy. Here, and a garden from the Eden of the just was planted by the word of the Lord God before the creation of the world. And he made there to dwell the man when he had created him. So this is going to Genesis you know, 2 7. Genesis 2 7. Okay, yeah, so here, it, this is also something interesting. I had a, a really pretty cool conversation with my friend Mickey Hatfield that called me the other day, and he believes that there's two separate creation accounts in there are, Genesis yeah. 1 and Genesis 2. Okay. Now, I, I've right. always been of the position that Genesis 2 is just sort of a retelling of Genesis 1, but again, in recent years, you know, as it is funny, you start going back to the scriptures and you st you make that the <laughs> I'll say make the mistake of praying, Father, remove my preconceived biases when I read <laughs> right. the text and just let the text say for what it says. You know, yeah. you start seeing all kinds of stuff, so you have to kind of put aside what you've been taught your whole life and right. just look at it. And y you do see a lot of, and when we get to chapter two, if, if you know what, four years from now at <laughs> this rate, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we ever get there? We, yeah, we made it through the first two we verses. The two so. verses that I, ooh, in the, <laughs> it, it's already been over an hour. Um, yeah. it, but it's interesting because in in chapter one, it's Elohim, 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 Elohim. In chapter two, it's Yod Hey Vav Hey Elohim. Right. Um, right. So that's interesting to me. Um, yeah, we'll get to that. I don't want to jump ahead, but you're saying yeah. in verse seven, uh, where in King James it says, "And Yod Hey Vav Hey Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul." In the Targum it says, "The word of Yod Hey Vav Hey Elohim formed man." Well, going down and. A garden from the Eden of the just was planted by the word of the Lord God before the creation of the world, and he made there to dwell the man when he had created him. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, again, it's the word of the Lord. And, um, hmm. you know, again, when you look at the Genesis 126 through 28 creation, just to bring it up really quickly, you'll see that male and female created he, he them. them. Yeah. 
they they were created in couples and multiple races, male and female, and they were created on the earth and told to multiply, be fruitful, and to replenish it. Whereas Adam, his body was created from the earth, but his spirit blown into it, he was placed in paradise, which is above the vaulted dome of the earth the, in the third heaven. And he was there to tend the garden of God. And you see that he was created by himself without a helpmate. And it wasn't until he named all of the animals that he recognized he was alone. And then God made Eve, took him, took the 13th rib from Adam and formed woman. And then, you know, they were a couple. And then it says that they shall be one flesh. Um, but they weren't told to go forth, multiply and replenish because they were originally created with a bright nature. They weren't mm -hmm. supposed to be mortal. And it wasn't until they were tempted to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then touching that tree that they uh, had their genitals appear. And then, you know, um, Satan deceived, beguiled Eve. I believe yeah, he so impregnated we gotta, her we're, with we're Cain. We're going to jump way ahead here. <laughs> yeah, we're going too far. We, uh, we, all right, we'll, we'll just go back. So, um, so, let me just share a couple more of these Word of the Lords, and then okay. we'll go back to the, the destruction, because I have one other thing to share with you okay. on with regard to that. Uh, another passage. And they heard the, verse, the voice of the Word of the Lord God walking in the garden in the repose of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from before the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so you see that, you know, Christ, it was Yeshua walking in the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, one other one. But to Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened to the, oh, wait, that was a different one. Uh, here. And the word of the Lord God said, behold, Adam, whom I have created is soul in my world, as I am soul in the heavens above. And that's speaking about where he's about to cast him from um, from paradise. But I got one other thing to share on the before we move on from the destruction uh, and the recreation. This is an absolutely fascinating uh, text, and it's the scroll of Thothis. Let me find it. Uh, it's going to take just a minute, but I it'll be worth it. You guys will be blown away by what is um, spoken about here. This is, um, again, from the Colburn Bible, and it talks about the destruction of Atlantis, which I believe is spoken about in Ezekiel chapter 26. And when you read the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, you also find this story replicated where it speaks about you know the Atlanteans uh, the destruction of Atlantis how they have to disperse and then a uh, thought goes to Egypt and then helps to elevate the people that he finds there uh, the children of Kim but beginning it says the first land on earth wherein men dwelt was not Kahemu it was a land out beyond the salt waters to this land came the immortal spirit in the form of a radiant one from heaven who had left his more enlightened place to dwell among beasts in the lower kingdom of sorrow. In some mysterious way, he became incarnated as man. How? We know not. But he founded the race of man. I believe this is, you know, Lucifer and his involvement with the pre-Adamites. It is not as recorded in tales told for the ignorant. None knows in truth the old motherland or where it was. There are tales, but they disagree. The nine bows say it was southward. The learned are not united in thought. Some say towards the west where the sun now sets, while others say towards the east where the sun rises. Southward are great mountains and forests, monsters and men covered with hair. Here winds are formed within the earth, issue forth from a black cavern. It is a place of chaos where water, soil, and air are not separate. The old motherland could not have been there. To the left-hand side there is a great wilderness, the land of Amaa. The old motherland could not have given birth to such as these. To the right hand is the wide plain of man-eaters, 
which stretches out to the far reaches of old Kaomu. This was barren even in the oldest times. To the north of the wilderness, the land is occupied by deformed men and dwarves, where amid this could have been the fertile pastures and plowlands, well watered from the Sky River, where men lived in peaceful content. The old motherland was never there, nor as some say in the waters beyond, which boil at the extremity. Beyond the wide river there was once a land graced with all riches, needful to men, crowned by the many walled Meru. But it was not the land of our birth, northward the home of the cool breeze, but beyond the lands which skirt the salt water are the one-eyed peoples hmm. and the giants with their white hair and eyes. Here the rocks and stones are of the whitest marble, and the trees bear white fruit. Thus in the whiteness the eyes of men are blinded in their youth, for even the grass grows white. Before this is the land of Hasuga, a land, a place unproductive and barren where fruit never appears on the trees and crops will not ripen. How could the old motherland lie in this direction? In the old books it is said that the old motherland was ruled by the Queen of Light, who was supreme above all. The temple tales tell that the lesser gods came to dwell among mortals when the mistress of brightness ruled in Kalathi, that they were sheltered in temples and priests were appointed to minister unto them. It is said that places of instruction were set up within the temples, but few men were taught the inner knowledge. It was rightfully held that it would be a danger to those without wisdom, and it had to be safeguarded. Is this not the tale told in the Book of Beginnings? It is said that Kalathi lay within the borders of Kaamu, but could it not have been the land of similar sounding name outward from Pontus beyond the God's land? Is it not set up both that they were engulfed in fire and water? In the Book of Beginnings, it is said the generations passed and a vast amount of knowledge and wisdom was accumulated and preserved in purity. It was the heritage of mankind. But though man had learned to cherish the light of truth and walk wisely with it, nevertheless, then as now, false priesthoods flourished. They pandered to the carnal desires of the underdeveloped and exploited the weaknesses of the ignorant. Their iniquity built up vast weight of evil in the netherworld, which projected itself into the material of earth so that the powers which upheld it became unstable. This caused all the southern part of the old land to sink down into heaving waters. The disaster was brought about through the ascendance of evil. Rites which awakened the dead were rife among the carnal-minded and ignorant. While those who reign, remained steadfast on the harder road, a spiritual development had fixed their eyes on the light ahead ignoring the pitfalls at their feet. It was then, even as now, will man ever learn. This was the aspect of the disaster, as written in the Book of Beginnings. There were openings in the land from which evil vaporous poured forth as a mist, descending upon the people like a mantle. It spread out and covered the whole face of the land. The tongues of the people were stopped, and they became dumb with fear. The ground trembled beneath them, and great tongues of flame shot up. The whole land heaved and rocked like an ocean wave. As it rose and fell, groaned and shook, the fires which strove beneath burst forth to be met with shafts of lightning striking down from heaven. A thick black cloud of smoke filled the land, and men were smothered in dust. As the setting sun rested on the horizon, it could be but dimly seen beneath the cloud as a fiery red ball. When it had gone, a gray, dense darkness prevailed, lit only by gray sheets of lightning. The waters broke heavily over the land, sweeping it clean. The plains and the cities were covered, and new shores formed around the mountains. 
the waters mounted up until all that moved and lived was covered and the land was submerged. Mountaintops alone remained above the rush of uplifted torrent. Whirlwinds blew and brought cold winds which cleared away the dust and debris. Mud banks were formed and a mountain mouth remained open to spew forth vile vapors. During one long, awful night, the doomed land was torn apart right. and south tank. Hold that thought. We are going to break. And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. For the final half-hour segment of the broadcast, I'm talking with Zen Garcia, and we are going through the book of Genesis line by line, and, of course, looking at other um, Targums, translations, uh, various resources, and and what other people around the world thought about different things. Um, Zen, I wanted to bring something up. Uh, You were were reading from, uh, that was an Egyptian text or something I think you were reading from, right? Before, yeah, it's called before. the Scroll of Thothis. Okay, the scroll that's like Thoth, Thoth or Thoth. Or yeah, T H O T H I S. So you know that's all backing up the whole idea of a uh, pre-Adamic destruction. Um, right. Yeah, I think one of the guys that was in the chat room was kind of going ballistic. I think he left already, but he was uh, <laughs> he was saying. Uh, Read Jeremiah 4.23, then read Jeremiah 4.16 and 4.31. It's all about the coming destruction of Judah. People, please do not be deceived by those taking things out of context. And he's saying, don't be deceived by Gnosticism. Trust your Bible, uh, not some books outside the Bible. That's how you get deceived. Well, well we would agree with that, first of all, that our Bible yeah, is, our, is our, is our primary Bible, source. Right? Um, you know, we're just looking at other things. It doesn't. We're not trying to tell anybody what to believe. Right. Um, but... It, uh, if you look up commentaries on Jeremiah 4.23, Ellicott's commentary of English readers, um, Benson commentary, Matthew Henry's pulpit commentary, Cambridge Bible, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they all seem to think that it's talking about a vision of Judah's coming destruction. So, um, that you know, these, of course, are all fairly modern, you know, within the last couple hundred years, mm-hmm. English commentaries. I think what we're trying to show here is that while these are English commentaries of the last few hundred years, the Hebrew people themselves, as well as those from other cultures, had a very different take on it. Right. I'll share with you a commentary about uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible Commentary. Uh, he says, the and, you know, they're globalists, but The earth was without form and void, or in confusion and emptiness, as the words are rendered in Isaiah 34, 11. This globe, at some undescribed period, having been convulsed and broken up, was a dark and watery waste for ages, perhaps, till out of this chaotic state the present fabric of the world was made to arise. The Benson um, commentary, he says, Genesis 1, 2, The earth, when first called into existence, was without form and void. Confusion and emptiness, as the same original words, are rendered in Isaiah 34.11. It was without order, beauty, or even use in its present state and was surrounded on all sides with thick darkness through the gloom of which there was not one ray of light to penetrate nor even so much as to render the darkness visible. I'll share one other commentary that makes mention of this as well. I got it up on the screen here, too, for everybody. Uh, BibleHub.com, you were looking at uh, Benson commentary? Yeah, the Benson, and this one is pulpit commentary. Yeah, it pulpit, says... Uh, pulpit, you know, I've always been rather... I, I, I like the pulpit commentary. Um, you know, I, I, I do look at the commentaries and see what other people had to say, yeah, but I, I found of Matthew Henry's pretty good, uh, Gill's... And pulpit are the ones I tend to look at more often. Yeah, I like gills too. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, in, in examining a text and a passage, 
I think we should read and study everything. Sure. I like to read and study well, everything. So. Well, that's the thing. It is a mark of an intelligent mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. It's like, okay, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, let's yeah. let's bring in the information. Let's let's digest it a little bit. You know, let, let's right. think about it. Let's weigh it against other opinions. Let's look at other texts, and you know, that's the whole purpose of of what I'm doing here. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. And myself, it, you know, it's like a investigator that goes into a crime scene. Right. He's going to examine and look at everything, everything mm-hmm. to see, you know, what is connected and reveals truth so that he can understand the underlying truth of what occurred. But with regard to the pulpit commentary, it says, was not had become without form and void, literally wasteness and emptiness. Tohu va bohu. The words are employed in Isaiah thirty four eleven and Jeremiah four twenty three hmm. to depict the desolation and desertion of a ruined and depopulated land, and by many have been pressed into service to support the idea of a preceding cosmos of which the chaotic condition of our planet was the wreck. Um, Murphy words were Bush, and then it says. Dietzi argues on the ground that Tohu Wabohu implies the ruin of a previous cosmos that version 2 does not state specifically that God created the earth in this desolate and waste condition and that death, which is inconceivable out of connection with sin, was in the world prior to the fall. That version 2 presupposes the fall of the angels and adduces in support of his view. Job thirty eight four seven. Mm, yeah, yeah, I've got that highlighted there. You know, you know, and this is just something I would say. You know, to to the listeners out there, this is this is why I say it's important to have parallel Bibles. Yes, Com- compare English. Look at the you know, look at all the translations. You know, we've we've got them up there. Why not use them? Read the commentaries. You know, th- what we're talking about isn't something Zen made up. It's not something that I made up. It's not something that's just the Gnostics made up. You know, these are things, right. th- these are actually discussions that good godly scholars have had discussions about, apparently, you know, for quite some time now. You know, even looking at some of these English translations. So, you know, again, we're not telling you what to believe, but I, I would just hope that, you know, as you're listening to this, you see the value in resources like BibleHub.com because they have a ton of stuff right there, right there at your fingertips for free right. to look at. You can Absolutely. compare all the English translations. You can click on the Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, and you can read commentaries and, and go as deep as you really want to. So right. yeah, that, that's that's awesome, man. The, the other thing is um, with regard to the actual Hebrew words, um, I took the all the Hebrew and – for that verse in chapter 1, verse 2. And when you translate the Hebrew and put in all the definitions, it essentially means, and the primeval earth existed, fell out, became, came to pass, was in a state of formlessness, confusion, unreality, emptiness, like a deserted wasteland, wilderness, a place of chaos, vanity and like an indistinguishable ruin void and wasted Mm -hmm. and again you know i believe that the most High didn't create it this way Mm -hmm. that something led to because why would you create it um destroyed destroyed first and then have to recreate it again right doesn't make any sense yeah, that's interesting. I I, it, I appreciate what you did there. Basically, what you did is you created a, a Zen amplified Bible because you you looked at formless and void and darkness, and just unpacked the uh, the Hebrew words tohu vavohu. Yes, right. Uh, and as you were saying that, I just went and clicked on each one and looked at them. You know, so you got formless is uh, Strong's number eighty four fourteen. Formless confusion, unreality, emptiness, formless confusion. You know. Chaos, confusion, desolation. You know, there's a whole bunch of waste, waste place. Uh, then you look at the next word, bohu, uh, emptiness, and the other one, uh, choshek, 28:22, darkness, obscurity. So yeah, that's a, a reasonable case. You know, something to think about anyway. 
Yeah, and, and again, you know, uh, Isaiah speaks about the, um, God creating the earth perfect and to be inhabited. It also says this in Second Ezra. And so in my mind, it just doesn't make sense that here in Genesis 1, uh, you know, we have the earth and the heavens created. And then verse 2, you see that the earth and that word haya means became or becomes. And so it not the earth was, but it became or becomes and then, you know, destroyed a deserted wasteland and indistinguishable ruin, which wasteland and ruin, examining the definitions and the context of those uh, words, means that something happened mm -hmm. that led to it becoming that way. And so that's what I believe we are uh, led to examine in Scripture with, again, uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 through 30 and also Ezekiel 26 and Second uh, Peter, you know, chapter 3, that it speaks about the world that then was yeah. and that it was destroyed and completely over covered with water. Now, see, and it, it's interesting in the, that you take Second Peter that direction because anytime I read Second Peter, I'm reading that the world that then was being the pre flood world, pre, pre, um, you, right, pre, pre Noah pre flood. Noah flood. Yes. Not. But, you know, um, there's actually been, and this is something I had a conversation with Mickey Hatfield with, is if you believe that there was a pre-edemic flood that created the tohu vavohu of Genesis uh, one two, uh, and the Jeremiah four passage, th so that would be flood number one. Book yeah. of of uh, Joshua tells you that during the days of Enosh, God flooded the then known uh, inhabited world at the time uh -huh. one third of what we would consider the whole earth right. was right. flooded uh, by the river Gion um, at that time it was like a pre-flood flood, flood uh, a pre, pre Noah flood flood right. uh, so you'd have the pre-edemic flood you'd have the pre Noah flood and then you'd have the Noah flood right uh, so but uh, and Second Peter that, le leads me to believe that he's talking about the pre-Noah flood. Uh, well, again, if you examine that the earth was completely destroyed and then the second world age begins after the recreation. So if you look again at the context of Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, we see that the earth being destroyed, the second world age begins with the recreation of the earth which was previous to even humanity being here. So, and we see that the second world age is compromised of the last 6,000 years and what would be the millennia reign because that's the Sabbath rest. And we know that this second world age, as it says in um, Peter, that this one's going to be destroyed by fire yeah. Yeah. Um, at the end. And reading, you know, Peter onwards, um, he tells us exactly that. Like, if you read past the passages that I read, um, you know, uh, the, it, it goes into that, how this world age will be destroyed by fire. We can actually pull that up. But um, and, and so, in it's my like opinion, Peter seven. is telling us about the world that then was, meaning the first world age, how it was destroyed, and then he's describing the second world age. Um, I, I I should actually pull that up so we can look at that. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, beginning verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. I still see it as Noah's flood. Yeah, but again, with the world that is now, that began not after Noah's flood, but it began after Genesis 1-2, because that's the beginning of the 6,000 years, the 7,000 years of this second world age, which it's this world age that we're in, that will be destroyed by fire. And then we see, but 
Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. He's speaking about this second world age, because again, you have the 120 jubilees, mm -hmm. which equals the 6,000 years, and then the millennial reign, which gives us the 7,000 years. So that takes it back to Genesis 1-2. Okay, I'm going to throw a little, little wrench in here. Um, I don't know if you caught the show that I did with Doug Woodward. On He's got a book he put out just recently. I think it's called uh, Rebooting the Bible. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, um, I yeah I did. We talked a little bit about some okay, so, uh, the 5,500-year timeline. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, the 5,500-year. That's exactly what I was going to go for because, right. you know, I, I, personally, I, I still like the – a day is with the Lord a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, and the whole 7,000-year timeline with the right. seventh day of God, 7,000 years uh, being the millennial reign of Christ. That that fits in a nice, neat package in my mind, yeah. and I like yeah, it. Right. Plus, I have a lot of timeline charts that I've made with that time, you know, in consideration. <laughs> right. And, you know, look, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wrong. All that stuff is an easy fix and re-upload and, you know, okay, okay, I was wrong. There you go. Um, I haven't looked into it to the degree that Doug has. Um, but I will say, you know, what he was saying uh, with the Septuagint and what has happened with the Mesoretic text and different things like that, throwing time all over the place, is if, if we go with what he's saying, then books like the Book of Adam and Eve make a whole lot more sense because they were oh, yeah. talking yeah, about, you know, 5,500 years from right. the, there was the prophecy that the Messiah was going to come. And I'm going, well, you know, in my timeline, it's 4,000 years, not 5,500. Right. You know, right. Um, so, yeah, I guess I have to get just get used to all my nice, neat boxes being shaken up. <laughs> you know, right. You know, uh, but that to say, I, yes, I do still believe as a, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. That's not to say that I believe that the creation days were God days. You know, that, that the creation days were extended period of time. We talked about this at the beginning of the show. And I just want to reemphasize uh -huh. that, that when he's talking about days, I believe he's talking about literal time periods, 24-hour time periods, not God days, a thousand years or more. Yeah, I, um, I agree. And because but, when you get right. to, like, the commandments, you know, for six days, if he's going to say day is a ex expansive period of time, right, well, right. you know, we're never going to have a Sabbath in our lifetime. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know? I, yeah, I fully agree with you. Yeah. Um, but again, and with the regard to the 5,500 year prophecy, uh, that is one of the dilemmas that I tackle in one of my latest books called The Ancient Prophecies of Christ, because I do track down that prophecy, uh, which, you know, the word of the Lord gave to Adam when he cast him forth out of paradise. And I found it in numerous places. Yeah, it pops uh, up a the lot. Gospel of Nicodemus and the first book of Adam and Eve. Another book called uh, Abaddon, the Angel of Death. I mean, so, yeah, I, I fully agree. And Doug and I, and, and along with another author named Kent Smith, we did a number of shows on this prophecy. Oh, man, I'm going to have to catch that. So you you guys have already talked about it at some length. That did, now, what was, oh, yeah, yeah, we've done yeah, we got uh, like, like several shows on it. Just we got, check out we, the 55 year prophecy. Okay, maybe that's I was going to say, try to summarize. we got eight minutes left in the broadcast, so probably... Uh, probably can't do that in eight minutes, so I'll just have to go. go <laughs> yeah, look, no, it's uh, too in depth. Go look it up. All right. Well, do we dare read the next verse? Um, yeah, um, yeah, because uh, uh, it's an interesting one as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, verse three, Genesis one three, and God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. And my first thought on that, as I've gone back to look at this, especially as I started as it pertains to uh, biblical cosmology, is that when the sun and moon are created, they are there to govern that which was already in existence beforehand. So while it is true that light generates heat and heat generates light, generally speaking, um, the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the word for sun just simply means heat. Um, and so the sun, while it's a greater light to rule the day, we have to understand that it's ruling something that pre-existed it for three days prior that day and mm -hmm. night had already been in existence so um here we have light and we we see in the uh, uh well verse four and god saw the light that it was good and god divided the light from the darkness and god called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day 
So we have the creation of day, light and night, 24-hour time period, day, um, prior to the sun and moon being created. So um, what is what are your thoughts on that? You know, um, I've heard some people, I'm not saying I agree with this, but some people say that that's when Yeshua was manifested, that he is the light, the became, you know, he's the light of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I don't lean on that. I don't lean in that direction myself, but what do you think this light is? I I absolutely believe that this is when Yeshua was given dominion over the angels, and that this is also the moment that iniquity was found in Lucifer because he was hmm. jealous of the Son of God and then plotted his overthrow. And that's why we see that the war in heaven occurs, and then you have him and the legion being cast down in day two. Uh, I'll read a passage from, and th- this is the reason why. Six minutes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this passage is from the Book of the Bee, Chapter 6. It says this. When the holy angels were created on the evening of the first day without voice, they understood not their creation, but thought within themselves that they were self-existent beings and not made. On the morning of the first day, God said in an audible and commanding voice, Let there be light, and immediately the effused light was created. When the angels saw the creation of light, they knew of a certainty that he who had made light had created them. And they shouted with a loud voice and praised him and marveled at his creation of light. As the blessed teacher said, when the creator made that light, the angels marveled thereat. And as it said in Job, when I created the morning star, all my angels praised me. We know that Yeshua is the morning star, as it says in Revelation. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion... Just as, uh, you know, with his baptism, we always see that it, his being called forth with an audible voice, that the the Father, in this case, saying, light be, or let there be light, was calling forth Yeshua and giving him dominion. And this is also when the creation became visible, and that's why the morning stars shouted for joy, because this and other passages describe how there was a period of darkness they sat in this darkness thinking themselves self-existent beings, but when they heard the voice of the Father call forth the light, they knew that the voice was the Father and that the light was the Son and that he was given then dominion over them and also that the creation became visible. They saw the expanse of it and they realized that you know the Son of God was uh, the leader of the angels and and this, again, as I said, was the moment with Lucifer um, decided to rebel and try to overthrow Christ and then tempted one-third of the angels to join him in this rebellion, and that led to the war in heaven, Interesting. which we can go so, into. Yeah, yeah. we've got four minutes left, but I'm thinking of uh, look, uh, Job 38, 6 through 8. Whereupon, where you know, this is God now talking to Job and his buddies. Okay, okay, sit down, and shut up. You guys have been talking long enough. Now, where were you when I did this? When I did that? Right? You know that that whole right. that whole dialogue. And verse six. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fast? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So, um, you know, in the chat room, even people are like, when were the angels created? Well, we don't see. At least that I'm not. A, I'm, I don't see it in Genesis where he's created angels now stars are a type of angel that we he says and he created the stars also that's on day four but day four is after the foundation of the earth had been laid so the sons of god angels um, including the watcher class of genesis 6 which we'll get to it in some length when we get to the book of enoch so angels including the watchers were there when the foundation of the earth was laid and the earth the dry land doesn't appear till after the firmament so you know what's a day three so, it's your opinion, and that's interesting. I, you know, I, I, just off the top of my head, what you said makes sense to me. Uh, so, when he created the heaven, especially if there's a pre-Adamic civilization that existed right. with angels that included the fall and you know all that kind of stuff, that you know there would be angels there to witness the laying of the foundation and the creation right here, yes. as according right here it says the morning stars sang and all the sons of God shouted for joy when the foundations of the earth were laid. That's interesting. Yeah, read Jubilees chapter 2, verse 2 as well. It tells mm. you that all the 
souls of the angels, both and all the souls of the creatures in heaven and the earth were created on the first day. Hmm. When the heavens and the earth were created, the angels were created then. And uh, they witness, again, you know, Christ being called forth as a light. Um, now, and being then, called forth, now, we're not saying that Yeshua was created. No, he was already pre-existent Correct. with the Father and the Son. Mm-hmm. I mean, with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Right. They are the pre-existing Godhead mm-hmm. that manifested all things. So you're saying he was called forth. In other words, the Father says, okay, son, come on in. You, yes. You, you, Let's you, show everybody your glory. You, you've got the, he is you've the got light the of the world. Mm-hmm. Given dominion over all the angels. Interesting. And they recognize the voice as the Father and the light as the Son. Very cool. Yeah, so that would be a good place for us to stop here. we got about a minute and a half left. Um, and then going into next week, we'll come on your show next, probably Thursday, if that works out. Yeah, I'll, we'll, I'll check my schedule and get back with you tomorrow. So we can, we can pick up uh, pretty much where we left off there on... Um, was it uh, Genesis one, well, three, three? <laughs> yeah, well, three through five, because we can kind of just yeah. kind of take that as one big chunk. Genesis right. three through five. All right, well, Zen, this was fun, man. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, great time, brother. Yeah, uh, and thank you guys so much for watching on YouTube. A very active chat room. I hope you guys behaved yourself. I wasn't really able to pay attention. Thank you to my <laughs> moderators who uh, probably had to use the wrench every now and then. Thank you to the Super Chats out there. Appreciate you guys. Uh, once again, I, I, I don't say it enough. I really, truly appreciate everybody who has given toward both our ministry of just our day-to-day work as well as our seed project. I'll try to give you an update on that soon. Lots of good stuff happening with seed. And uh, we'll talk about that next time. See you guys next Wednesday, 11 p.m. Good night, everybody. God bless all. Good night. Good night.